the headlines at this hour, the U.S. says it considers maintaining a strong forward military presence in the Pacific as important. We do believe that uh, it is important to maintain a strong presence uh, in the Pacific. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we maintain uh, the 11 carriers uh, in the Navy in order to ensure that uh, we have sufficient forward presence. Britain sells gun silencers and weapons sites to Bahrain despite the Al-Khalif regime's brutal crackdown on protests. And in Greece, pensioners take to the streets in the capital Athens to protest against harsh spending cuts. Welcome to the news here on Press TV. Starting off in the US, where senior Pentagon officials have defended President Barack Obama's military spending plan, which includes a shift in strategic focus to the Asia Pacific region. We do believe that uh, it is important to maintain a strong presence uh, in the Pacific. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we maintain. Uh, the 11 carriers uh, in the Navy in order to ensure that uh, we have sufficient forward presence. There's nothing like a carrier to be able to uh, allow for, for quick deployment uh, in that area. Uh, and uh, that'll give us a, a great capacity to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, show our force structure uh, in the Pacific. Well, Pernetto made the comments during a testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee. He also said the U.S. planned a rotational military presence in Australia and the Philippines. Many view the new strategy as part of the U.S. attempts to hedge itself against China's growing influence in the region. We do. Michael Malouf, a former Pentagon official, joins me live from Washington for his thoughts on this. So welcome to the program. So, Mr. Malouf. Uh, what perceived threat is there in the Pacific that the U.S. is aiming to increase its military presence there, especially near China and North Korea? Well, I think it's, um, the, the point is, is to have uh, the United States maintain a, uh, a presence uh, on the peripheries, since it does have vital uh, national security interests uh, in the Pacific, as well as the Middle East and elsewhere. But um, uh, the, the uh, carrier task forces will... Be, uh, uh, represent uh, a pulling back of, uh, of, of ha and, and having them for quick deployment, but pulling back from of, uh, of having standing armies uh, like we, we saw in, uh, in Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq, and, uh, and to move uh, carriers uh, and have them ready for uh, rapid deployment of, uh, in case there's any emergencies. Um, it also is to protect vital national interests, as I said. Uh, you have uh, not only uh, China, which is uh, showing more assertiveness in the uh, South China Sea, but also uh, to protect uh, uh, countries that have other interests, such as uh, Vietnam, the Philippines, who have uh, uh, concerns about uh, China's uh, uh, desire to uh, overtake uh, some of the islands that uh, Ch uh, China claims to be uh, part of its uh, own um, uh, in, uh, sphere of influence. Now, the, the other aspect of all this is uh, to protect uh, and give assistance to India. And you have uh, two of the largest democracies in the world now basically coming together. I I India itself is showing more assertiveness, wanting to put its forces in the uh, Pacific. And the Chinese are very much against uh, any foreign involvement in, that, in, what, in an area that they regard as their sphere of influence. So it, We've already had a few confrontations, and, uh, and the likelihood is very high that we're going to have additional ones. Indeed. Well, uh, uh, some say the U.S. is aiming to counter China's economic rise uh, with a military option, and so question uh, such an attitude in international affairs as being counterproductive. Well, I would agree. Uh, the, the, again, the, the United States really sees a vital interest in maintaining a good, strong economic relationship with China as well as uh, maintaining its military uh, uh, 
uh, superiority and ability to have freedom of the seas. That's another issue that's an, an ancillary thing uh, involved here in that uh, China has challenged uh, any uh, foreign forces in the South China Sea area. And there is the, the question of uh, right of passage uh, in international waters, which the United States is asserting that it has that right to do. And also, you have, we do have other vital interests, such as protection of Japan um, and also Taiwan. Now, that may be diminishing with Taiwan somewhat uh, because of our interest in wanting to maintain good relations with, with the mainland. But uh, there is, there is uh, the concern uh, that the United States has with, with respect to China, uh, basically uh, telling us to stay out when, in fact, uh, the United States believes it has the right to... Uh, be in those waters because they are international. Indeed. And uh, finally, uh, as a former Pentagon official, someone who's been in the works there, uh, what would be, uh, what would we be seeing in the foreseeable future with regards to the whole militarization process? Well, you're going to see a cutback uh, principally in um, ground forces. And this, this strategy really reflects a decision made by the Obama administration when it first came into office. It's just been delayed because of the ongoing wars both in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. Iraq has basically been uh, uh, stood down. Uh, they're trying to uh, bring troops back uh, out of uh, Afghanistan. But the, the idea is to move, strategically move U.S. forces to peripheral areas but still have a readiness uh, in case there's a, a brush fire somewhere and they need to move uh, troops in quickly. That means they're going to be more uh, usage of uh, uh, special forces uh, as opposed to massive armies. Those days are basically gone for now and, uh, uh, and, and that's being reflected in the budget. There is concern about cutting back. Uh, the the, the uh, defense secretary says that they will maintain the carrier fleet and the task forces and you're going to see that uh, not only in the Pacific but also uh, in, in the Middle East. Of course, not to mention the drone strike agenda. Well, uh, that's, that's on land. You're going to have, you're going to have more drones uh, flying. Again, this is for a, like a sixth generation type of warfare in which you have a standoff warfare uh, going on rather than having standing armies. This is something that uh, is coming of age now. And modern armies are, and modern militaries are beginning to look in that direction more and more now. And you are going to have more drones, more uh, technical, uh, technological capabilities uh, as a substitute for the, the ground forces that uh, we've heretofore had. Indeed. All right, we'll leave it there for the time. Many thanks there to Michael Malou, former Pentagon official from Washington. Moving on now in Bahrain, protesters have pledged to march back to the capital of Manama's Pearl Square, the focal point of demonstrations against the ruling Al Khalifa regime. The coalition of youth of the February 14th revolution has called on people to start returning to the square in the early hours of Wednesday. On Tuesday, protesters made several attempts to march to the roundabout. They were marking the first anniversary of their popular revolution, which started on February 14th, 2011. However, Saudi backed regime forces fired tear gas to disperse the protesters. Up to 30 people, including rights activist Nabi Rajab and six American activists, were detained during demonstrations. The main opposition were far parties, says regime forces also attacked villages, and that many houses were hit by tear gas canisters. Well, Britain has continued to sell arms to Bahrain despite the popular uprising in the Persian Gulf Kingdom. Fresh official figures reveal that the British government approved the sale of military equipment worth more than a million pounds to the Al Khalifa regime after the revolution in Bahrain began. The UK government approved licenses for gun silencers, weapon sites, artillery, as well as components for military training aircraft. The revelation has been made by Britain's Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. It also says that the Saudi forces sent to Bahrain last March were dispatched in British military trucks. Anti-arms trade activists have slammed the approval of new weapons sales to Bahrain. British Business Secretary Vince Cable has admitted that London does, does business with governments that are not democratic and have poor rights records. Moving on, people are holding rallies in Saudi Arabia's eastern province to mark the first anniversary of the popular uprising in Bahrain.
The protests are taking place in the city of Latif. The demonstrators condemn the brutal crackdown on Bahraini protesters. They frequently held rallies in solidarity with the uprising of the Bahraini people. The protesters have also slammed the Saudi regime for its military intervention to help crush the uprising in the kingdom. Eastern province has also been the focal point of a popular uprising against the al Saud rule since last year. The Riyadh regime has strictly banned any protest rallies in the country, but the demonstrators have defied the ban. Meanwhile, as the unrest in Syria continues, opposition groups try to gain international legitimacy. The unrest continues in Syria, with Western-led pressures on President Bashar al-Assad to step down. Meanwhile, opposition groups inside and outside the country are also trying to grasp the opportunity to gain international support and legitimacy. The latest such move has been followed in Qatar by the main opposition group, the Syrian National Council, or SNC. The group is to choose its second leader since it was formed in October last year. The current leader, Burhan Khalil, is likely to be re-elected for a three-month period of leadership. The SNC claims that its decisions are independent from external interferences. So far, many Arab and Western countries have financially supported the Syrian opposition groups. The SNC has been formally recognized by the U.S., France and Spain. The council is meeting in Qatar, a leading anti-Damascus country among Arab nations, which has even suggested sending troops to Syria to help topple President Assad's government. In addition, there are allegations of Libyan Transition Council aid to the Free Syrian Army, which fights against Damascus inside Syria. The unrest in Syria, which started in March last year, has so far claimed more than 6,000 lives, according to the UN. Damascus blames foreign-backed armed gangs for the fatalities. Moving on, Greek pensioners have taken to the streets of the capital Athens to protest against harsh spending cuts. The pensioners slammed the government's new measures and called on decision makers to keep their hands off their pensions. This as Greek leaders struggle to find ways to cut another 325 million euros in spending, as demanded by the EU and the IMF. On Sunday, Athens agreed to slash 3.3 billion euros in wages, pensions and jobs to receive a new loan much needed to avert a default. Meanwhile, the Eurogroup chief says Greece has yet to meet conditions for a new bailout. In a statement, Luxembourg Premier Jean-Claude Juncker says Greek leaders have not produced the required assurances on the implementation of the program. Greece is under pressure to give written commitments in return for a 130 billion euro bailout. Now, Tehran University has honored assassinated Iranian scientists by awarding them honorary doctorate degrees. Prasvi's Amir Hossein Iskandar tells us more. Families of assassinated Iranian nuclear scientists get honorary doctorate degrees. Tehran University presents the family of Daryush Reza Najad an honorary doctorate degree in electrical engineering and Mustafa Ahmad Roshan an honorary doctorate degree in nano and biotechnology in memory of their advancements in nuclear technology. President Najad was a nuclear scientist who was assassinated by a gunman last July. He was about to receive his master's in electrical engineering from Khaja Nasreddin Tusi University of Technology in Tehran. They're honoring my late husband with a doctorate degree in electrical engineering. He had one week to go before his dissertation when he was assassinated. That's why the university is honoring him, because of his great accomplishments. Ahmadi Roshan was assassinated by terrorists on January 11th of this year in Tehran. Mustafa Ahmadi Roshan was a deputy of commercial affairs at Iran's Natanz nuclear facility, which are under constant supervision by the International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA. He was also a chemical engineering graduate of Iran's famous Sharif University of Technology. This is an honor for the Islamic Republic of Iran, especially that our scientists are working.